Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Three Dad Bods. We've got two of us here today on Selection Sunday for March oh, Madness. I'm Brent, and we got Carl here. How you doing, man? Hey, pretty good. How you doing this morning, Brent? I'm I'm good. <laughs> We're a little technologically, um, <laughs> I guess, lacking yeah. maybe, <laughs> but we we got it figured out. We got it going. Um, I think before it's we get, age. yeah, <laughs> man. So a little a little spicy excitement going on there this morning. Yeah, yeah. We at least we're on online right now and talking to everybody. So I'm I'm happy about that. <laughs> so before we kick it off here, um yesterday, March eleventh, was my parents' seventy third wedding anniversary. Oh my seventy so three? Seventy three wow. years ago yesterday. Bob and Bev tied the knot. So I just wanted just to kind of throw that out there. Um, talked to my mom yesterday. She's, you know, a little, little memory stricken and, and stuff like that as can be expected. But, you know, that's just like baffling 73 years ago. Just, just incredible. So happy anniversary to mom and dad. So, March Madness kicks off, you know, the we got tournament selection Sunday. Um it it feels like to me these days, you know, it's it doesn't have as much, you know, boom or or luster or like I you know, I, I can remember looking forward to selection Sunday, you know, fifteen, twenty years ago. Do, do you even fill out a bracket? Do you do you go through that stuff? Yeah, we're talking about it. My kid, my sons like it, you know. I mean, even though they don't know what they're, you know, they don't really follow the uh, basketball season itself. I still think it's the one thing left in college basketball that people care about is the brackets, you know. Yeah. Because you talk about it at work or some lady that likes, you know, she, she bases it on – the mascot like bill walton would probably exactly <laughs> and she wins you know and that that that's you know but um as far as getting too serious about it um usually only if the team i like the kittens if they get in um uh, I, you know sometimes the local teams like uh i thought uvu was going to get in but then they <laughs> they lose in an incredible semifinal game to southern utah and then Southern Utah gets beat by Grand Canyon of all teams. So they're going to be in there. Um, uh, I guess they're a Phoenix team, but uh, yeah, it's just not the same. I mean, to, uh, I, you know, I'm looking at BYU, for example, next year, they're getting into the big 12. I think I'd be more excited about the big 12 uh, tournament than <laughs> in some ways the NCA, but I must say still the the first two weeks, or the first, yeah, at least the first two weeks of the NCA tournament are probably uh, two of the most exciting weeks in basketball. I agree. I, you, you get those twelve and thirteen seeds that are knocking off these big boys and stuff, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, what I mean, when we were kids, I think the NCA was only like forty-eight teams. Um, no, it was sixty-two. Well, it was sixty-four, but it was sixty-four, it was, sixty-four. But it, but well, I guess I'm a little. I went back. I mean, when Bird and Magic played. So, okay, so let's let's talk a little history here. The first NCAA basketball game championship game that I ever watched was with my dad, and it was in 1970 or maybe it was 1980. Was it 80? The Bird. It was in Salt was Lake 79. City. 79. Was it 79? Okay. Yeah. And it was in Salt Lake City, and the Indiana State. I think it's the Sycamores. Uh, yep. I've never heard of them before, and uh, and haven't ha- heard from heard about them since uh, since nope. Bird from there. <laughs> but uh, played Magic Johnson and the Michigan State Spartans, and uh, I remember. Um, I mean, it was one of the ga- <laughs> that was a great game. I mean, Bird. Do you know that game is still the most watched NCAA championship game in history? Yeah, well, back from felt, 1979. Well, then the other memory I have of it was a couple years later, 
Danny Ainge went the length of the court against Notre Dame in the Sweet 16. Of course and won he did. My, yeah. <laughs> well, I was a big deal, man. I was I was a big BYU fan back then. So it seems like to me, so I th- I think especially maybe people our age stopped following during the season. Because I remember I would I could watch any college basketball game. Like during the season or whatnot. And since since it's transitioned into this one and done atmosphere, you know, kids come in as freshmen, they play one year, and then they yeah. move on to the pros. Oh, and it's really good. Yeah. You, you yeah. don't get an opportunity to build a following for your team and watch that team grow and expand. You know, like you look at the, the UNLV team from the 90s. You look at even the Duke teams, you know, during that time with Christian Leitner, those guys stayed for three and four years and you built a relationship with that team that, that that's why the, the bird and magic game that you talk about had so much hype and so much yeah. built up enthusiasm because for three years, people been watching those two players build to the greatness that they built to. And now yeah. They want their money. You you, they yeah, want their exactly. Money. You you don't get the 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 following, the the growing with the team. You know, you you build even in football. You you still get you know, hey, my quarterback is a is a sophomore this year. He's going to be back next year. You know, we're going to be doing this and doing that. You just don't get that. You don't know what you get year from year. Well, I think I think it was guys like LeBron and you know those Kentucky Calipari teams in the. 90s 2000s early 2000s that kind of today thing you know you had one kentucky class that came in five freshmen and by the time they were sophomores they were all in the nba (laughs) yes well i think the time we first heard the or got the enthusiasm as with a group of freshmen coming in was that michigan team with chris weber and uh, Jalen, what's his name? You, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. And, and so, but we, they weren't one and done. Like they had that one year, they were really good. They made it to the final four. The next year, they make it to the champion. You know, we watched this team through two and three years grow yeah. together and, and get a following and or a hatred. I couldn't stand Michigan at all, you know, uh-huh. but it, it was still there. You know what I mean? A, a, a sense of, you know, just, a, a team, and I, it feels like it's not a team anymore. It's just a group of individuals that come in from an AAU group, and it's like an AAU expanded. You know what I mean? Well, I think I think you just kind of hit what's different now than what was different when we were kids. There was no AAU. Um, you played all four sports. Like, let's take okay. I know you hate Danny, but let's look at Danny Age's uh, uh, high, you know high school career. He was. An All-American high parade. Back then, that was a big deal to be in that parade. Uh, that was the insert in your Sunday paper. But he was a parade All-American football player. He was an All-American baseball player that got drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays. And he actually played pro he baseball. He, well, he played basketball at BYU. And I then think he, he was, was the first two pro sport athlete, if I remember. Yeah, and then he was drafted by the Boston Celtics. So, I mean, you know, and he had a pretty decent career in the NBA. He wasn't like anything close to, you know, a Jordan. He was a role player. Or, but when you player. have players with Bird and Perkins, yeah. or not Perkins, but Parrish and, you know, McHale, I mean, you're going to be a role player and enjoy it. <laughs> and, and he's and he's completely dominated as a general manager in the NBA. So, um, I have to admit that. Well, he's, he's been very good with that. And hopefully he'll get the Utah Jazz to where they need to. But uh, here's here's the thing. It, it ha- You're right. It has changed. Now, here's here's my hope. I know in football I'm not too excited about the uh, NIL or NLIs or whatever they are, the, uh, you NIL. know, the contracts. But in basketball, this might change it a little bit because think about it this way. What if you're kind of a marginal guy that wouldn't even make – well, could make the G League – but might get lucky and get into Europe, but some guy on campus is willing to pay. I know some boosters willing to through a company is willing to give you one of these deals where 
you make, you know, two or $300,000 that year going to school. I mean, you know, okay. Yeah. I can wait another year or two. Maybe I will get better. And, 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 and that point, these schools can start creating this picture for these recruits saying, why do you want to leave early? Um, you've got, I mean, we have an opportunity with this team uh, to go deep in the NCAA, which will not only will, I mean, that's going to reward you now, not just in the NBA in the future or in the G league or, you know, some other, cause you, you're really not going to be a first round draft pick. I mean, we can tell that right now or a second round draft pick. I mean, you're probably not even going to make the G league. Um, you know, you might be playing in Europe next year. Why do you want to do that if you can make two to three hundred thousand dollars over the next a year over the next two or three years? And uh, some of these kids are getting five hundred grand or more. I mean, some of them are more than that. I, I just, I mean, things are changing. That's why I'm saying. And maybe even even though everybody thinks anytime there's change that oh that's the end of basketball or that's the end of football, but I I I, I think this actually might help basketball because. Now it's going to keep some of that talent from immediately just trying to, to grab a paycheck somewhere else. So anyway, that's my opinion. I, I agree with you to a point. However, here's the big difference. And the big difference between college football and college basketball is college football has no competition until you get to the pros. So – the NCAA can say, all right, we're going to require players to stay through their sophomore year. In That's basketball, true. you have a you have so many more leagues that players can go make. You look at the European leagues. You look at the Turkish leagues. You look in inside of, of Asia and China and those teams. And, and you've got these desperate teams that are like in Shanghai that will take a kid who's got mediocre talent and pay him a million plus. You know, and and so you're not yeah, the, talking about Jimmer, though, are you now? Come on, man. What's that? You're not talking about my boy Jimmer for dead, are you? <laughs> well, anybody, but yeah. but he's he's a good example, you know. So yeah. that the it's not like the NCAA can come in and say, well, you know what? If you come to the NCAA, you're going to have to stay through your sophomore year because they're going to be like, well, fine then, we won't go to the NCAA. We're going to go straight to Turkey and we're going to play in that league, and I and I'm going to make a million plus. Just like, uh, oh, who's the dad that's got the three boys that are really good? Oh, um, yeah, I know. Who always ball, stuck his ball. nose and everything. Yeah. yeah. He took his yeah. kid out of high school and took him to Europe to play. Because that's true. That's true. It, and they're it's all great. about that money right now, you know? And, and that's the difference between college basketball and college football is you've got that competition that of all these – other leagues saying, well, we'll take this kid. Hey, this guy can make a bucket. We'll take him. Hey, this kid's seven foot four. We'll take him and pay him right away. Well, I think, I think, yeah, I, well, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm positive. I'm, I'm trying to be positive about these changes with the NLI or NIL um, paying these players. I, I think the first initial year or two, it's going to be a little, the market will eventually dictate what these kids are actually worth and not this kind of hyper, uh, I think effort by some companies to get their name out. And then they realize, Hey, I mean, having this kid tweet my commercial about um, sports powder is not getting the uh, return of investment that I thought it would get. Therefore um, maybe I'm going to cut down a little bit on, what we pay out. You'll still have alumni that really love their university that um, will overpay for some of these kids to help build a program, but at least it's going to be above board now. And it's not going to, I mean, it was happening already. I mean, you know, these kids yeah. aren't driving these hot cars because they're from downtown. They grew up in, in urban Detroit and all of a sudden they can afford uh uh, Tesla's, um, uh, no, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, so I think, uh, things will even out on that end. Now, the question you were bringing up earlier was why aren't we a big, why isn't the NCA a big deal? And I don't, well, let, let me ask this question to you first though, yeah. in regarding NIL, because 
it, it's almost like it's the wild west. There, there's no rules. There's no, you know, what you can yeah. and can't do. But when you have, when you have NIL mixed with the transfer portal, oh, that's this terrible. is the hard part is how do these two coexist? Because let's say you're Bob's car shop and you've got Todd McPhee, who's a player for Vanderbilt that is doing your ads. But Todd McPhee is like, you know what? I really don't like it in Nashville and I'm going to transfer to Ohio State in the transfer portal, but you've got this two year contract to make money for Bob's car shop. But how, how do those two things coexist together? There's too well, many variables. You know what I mean? Well, I think the institutions should have some control on that kind of, like with a scholarship, for example, and their programs. So in other words, player a comes to my school and he agrees. And usually these scholarships, I, cause I was with my son being a, you know, a runner and being in college and running for a college team, the way these scholarships work and they've been very unfair in favor of the universities for years. True. And so, so he could go to like say Idaho state and, and agree, I'm going to run for you coach. And then the coach is gone two years later, a new coach comes in and says, I, you know what? I, I think you need to take a hike. You know, I, I don't want you on my team. In other words, Eric wouldn't have the the ability to, you know, stay there because, you know, he'd be he'd be sent into the transfer pool or transfer portal and uh, have to find someplace else to go play at or, you know, quit the sport altogether if if he can't find another place to to apply his trade. So it's been very unfair for the college kids. So to me, part of me is looking at it and saying, you know what? Everybody should have a fair opportunity to agree to some sort of contract. And then the contract, and we have the ability to do it. It should be enforced equally uh, with each party. So um, for example, if I co play for Idaho state, it should be like a one year agreement or they should agree to a two year agreement, but that means the university also has to agree to two years. They can't just arbitrarily say after one year, hit the road, Jack. So, right. um, if, if the, if the NCA, which has been very inept in this whole thing would step up and act like it in, a, uh, what do they call it? Uh, they're supposed to be some an enforcement agency basically right so that the colleges and universities can have some sort of organization and and uh, uh compliance and governance uh to their organization but then you've got big conferences like the big five conferences that are threatening to leave the nca if they don't get what they want in college football this is a huge business it's always yeah. favored yeah. one party and one party only, the universities. It hasn't favored the athletes. So to me, seeing all this, I'm kind of like, you know what? Welcome to uh, the free market, boys and girls. And you guys have to understand, too, these athletes are people. They're human beings, and they should be treated that way with some respect. And, yeah, there's some bad examples, you know, but those are, you know, the university is basically – um, protected themselves in most cases from that bad press, and 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 they can always point the finger at that kid who who wants his money. Well, you know what? The reason they want their money is because they're not. You know, I mean, then then give them that money. And if you can't give them that money, maybe this program that they've created now will work. And I think we just need to give it some time. And I think it's gonna actually in the long run, it's. It's going to be fair for everybody, including including the institution. So I don't think college basketball or college football, because of the money deal with these kids, is a is it is an is it in any danger? Would be a good word to put it. I think I think there's some other factors that might put football in danger or college basketball in danger, and they have they're unrelated to the kids that are playing the sport. Wouldn't you agree on that? That makes sense. I, I do. And, and the thing that, you know, you, you kind of bring up enforcing universities to. Yeah. And, and we st- we see full ride scholarships, you know, like you, you get like a Zion Williamson. A kid yeah. had a four year full ride scholarship sitting over there at Duke. But how yeah. soon until we start to. And, and 
now do we start to see universities taking a chunk of that NIL money and saying, you know what, our star quarterback, if you want to work out a deal with him, you need to pay the university 30% of that contract. And because they're the name that's building this boy and then building his career. And it's going to be a matter of time, especially some of these power five schools where yeah. now these kids are going to be getting 10, 12, you know, $20 million to go yeah. to Alabama and Alabama may be saying, you know what, we're going to take about 5 million of that. Well, here, here again, you're pointing to the actual culprit. It's the greedy institutions that are doing really? this. I personally feel, I think that, I mean, okay, let's look at it. You know who the number one state employee is in the state of Utah? Well, uh, I mean, it's in every state. It is in every single state, the college yeah. football coach. Every state. Yeah, yeah Kyle yeah. Whittingham. The, the most, he's, he's paid the most money in the state of Utah. Um, I mean, maybe yeah. Sitaki and, will... And remember... Him. His yeah. contract is sitting at probably what four, four and a half million. Where you've got Tennessee with Josh Heupel, who's making seven mil. You got Nick Saban in Alabama, who's making nine million plus. You, yeah. you know, it, it, you got uh, Jimbo Fisher in the state of Texas, who's making ten million plus. I mean, it, that, well, that's but, what it, it goes back to a, or the another podcast we had where I was asking why is they're not free school for state residents. <laughs> you oh, know? That's, good. that's a good question. I mean, well, yeah, and I don't want to get too political on no, this no, no, no. cast, yeah. but yeah, no, those are good points. And that's, that's why any type of opportunity for the student athlete to have some sort of ability to, to do his own thing or, or, you know, it's like, um, I mean, you know, they, they already are limited in terms of their time. They don't have a lot of time to ha work a second job. I mean, a lot of these athletes are working summer jobs like knocking doors or, you know what my son did last year for $6,000. It wasn't a lot. But every day he would have to go out into these fields, these farmer fields, if for his, uh, he, he was working an internship. Uh, for his degree, which is a microbiology degree. And they would make him go out all day long in the sun. And they had to, uh, and basically it's kind of like picking lettuce. You were checking these, what they call biomes and checking um, uh, for this experiment that one of the, uh, uh, you know, PhD students were running. Anyway, wow. uh, he was there from six in the morning till six at night. And then on top of that, he had to still work out and do his workouts for his team. And then during the school year, you know, he's on his, you know, they're going to lab all day. They're going to school all day. Then they have to work out with the teams for several hours every day. And then on top of that, they're supposed to also carry, you know, a job, a part-time job. And, and that's, and, and these expenses aren't cheap. They have to pay for their food. They have to pay for their housing, you know, and this, the, the, the colleges actually don't pay that much in terms of the scholarships for most of the Olympic sports. Your, yeah. your football players might be living the high life a little <laughs> bit, but even then before NIL, they weren't even, I mean, a lot of them were, were, were having a difficult time. So uh, the schools have been very stingy, um, and the NCA, they have it's almost been a cabal, the two of them, have controlled this. I mean, it's kind of like their own little uh, kingdom that they've been able to hold on to until that Supreme Court ruling. And now it's like everything, you know, everybody's complaining now, like, oh, these students are running amok. And I'm like, no, they're getting what they deserve. And actually, if you just let it play out, I think in the long run, it's actually going to stabilize these kids from wanting to jump immediately to the NBA. I mean, you're taking these boys from downtown Chicago or LA or wherever you're recruiting them from who, who live in terrible poverty. And then you're, you're, you're telling these kids, Oh no, no, you need to wait four years before you can benefit. And your mama can get her house. She can get out of that ugly crack house. She's in. Oh, in four years, it can finally pay off. What if he gets injured? What if, what yeah. if, what if, yeah. I mean, what if the coach doesn't like him? 
Uh, or he moves, I, and the coach leaves, and then it's a new system, or you know, all yeah. kinds of stuff. Yeah, there's no guarantee for these kids, and so I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, screw the colleges. They, they, they just, I mean, they've had a fat city for so long. It's finally time for things to equalize a little more. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty dang happy. So anybody that starts whining about it, I'm just like, you really don't understand it, probably because you've never been recruited or been a college athlete. And second, I mean, there's so much of this money. I mean, look at these Big Ten numbers for their new football contract. It's over a hundred million. I mean, well, Purdue worth a hundred million. Give me a break. <laughs> I, I I think that the <laughs> I I think that the sports where you're going to see help from NIL the most. So football is granted, I think it's like 75 scholarships or something like that. Basketball, right. you have 12 scholarships. I don't know if you know this. Baseball, universities are only allowed six to eight scholarships oh, it's, for baseball yeah. teams. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> These kids it, running around on... Exactly. Yeah. So you have, you have only... On, on a team of, you know, probably 18 to 25 kids, only eight of those kids are scholarship players. And you look at a university like Vanderbilt, who's been a, a powerhouse when it comes to college baseball. Um, but Vanderbilt is a very expensive institution. <laughs> it, it is an Ivy League school that is in the SEC, but has been dominant. And I think you're now going to start to see these NILs affecting baseball because this is what's crazy about college baseball. And I, I know you probably don't follow it, but here in the South, it, it's huge. It's, it's enormous. And, you know, the college baseball tournament that's in Omaha and, and um, it's, it's a very large revenue sport that, is just absorbing all the money to the schools. That's all it's doing. It's it's not having to give additional scholarships to kids. Um, there's only two or three baseball coaches who get paid on a staff, and so you're having third base co- third base coaches and first base coaches who aren't even getting paid by the university. It's it's insane how archaic it is, and that begins the transition into the other sports like bowling and cross country and volleyball and you know where you're there's only partial scholarships you know you as, as a student I'm, I'm sure like your boy doesn't have a full ride does he, he he's got like oh. a partial scholarship that assists right right yeah that's right yeah and so yeah. all these championships and stuff still come through through college championships on cross country and bowling and golf and all that the universities are still absorbing money from these championships, which isn't like, you know, 50 or $90 million that you get from college basketball and and college, you know, football, but it's still money from these sports and recognition to the schools and identity placed on the schools. Right. And these, there's schools that have billion dollar endowments. I don't know if you, you, I mean, these are nations from (laughs) camera. Yeah, and and none of that money is uh, going to new students. Okay, so so for example, I go to let's say I want to go to Stanford. Um, I, to get into Stanford, it's incredibly difficult for the average non non athlete. Uh, and even athletes, it's tough, difficult. But let's say I'm a, a not an athlete. I go to Stanford. Um, I get in barely. Then I've got to face a tuition that's incredibly high. And then uh, on top of that, uh, let's say I want to go and support all the school's activities and sports. Okay, where where's the benefit to me? Okay, I'm getting a first class education, right? That 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 is pretty cool. That's that's worth that's worth I, whatever dollar figure you want to assign it. Uh, but you can get college education, quality education is pretty much anywhere these days. So, I mean. I mean, um, with the Stanford behind it versus the name Stanford, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, okay, it's, it's a wow. You get to the top of the list. Okay, it's worth something, right? Okay, that's why right. you're going there. Second, uh, you've got to go. I mean, these these schools can't exist on nothing, so they have to have money to operate. They have to have buildings and research and everything else. Okay, so some of that's generated from sports, but the, a lot of that comes from outside community because it benefits from these universities. 
So the community itself is what helps. And then a lot of these state schools get funded too by taxpayers. All right, so here's, here's where the problem comes into play. I've got these students that aren't benefiting from all this CBS and ESPN money rolling in. And the, not even the student athletes are really benefiting that much. And what is the, where's the money going to coaches? It's going to the facilities. Now these facilities are awesome, but these kids are only going to be able to use these facilities for a few years. And how awesome does it have to be for these kids to actually play their sports? Maybe we're putting a little too much into these facilities to attract some of these kids, but then in the long run, how much does it really benefit them? And look, and when you want to say, well, yeah, I need a $200 million football facility, which isn't the stadium, by the way. Um, okay, why do you need a $200 million where Utah State can b- almost beat you on the football field with its team, Wisconsin, and its facilities, $20 million? What's the big difference between the two? Oh, I have it. You don't? Okay, I get that. But bottom line it. Where is the money from all these deals going in terms of the average student? Uh, why is their tuition so high? Why are these kids practically starving and all their parents have to shell out tons of money to keep these kids in school? And everybody's benefit. The only ones that are benefiting are the schools with the inflated in- tuition prices. They are the only ones benefiting. They are. And there. that's the thing that just kills me. And that's why I like have no empathy for these universities um, or their coaching or any of it. I, I just, I it makes me roll my eyes when I hear these complaints, even by fans that really don't know what the heck they're talking about. And I'm thinking, you know what? You don't, you don't get it. And that's why I'm like, yeah, you go get yours, man. I mean, if you can get one of those little side deals, go for it and then hustle and, and turn it into something. And that's, you know, that's what my son's doing and that's what other kids are doing. And I think, um, and in the long run, this is going to be beneficial to not only the kids, but to the universities as well. They'll see it. They're going to have some of these, like we were talking about basketball where it's so unstable. I mean, if you have a really good positive NIL program at your school that you've, you know, and, and the university itself can get too involved, but it can bring in those invest, you know, those those alumni that could create those programs and kind of set the guidelines for it and say, hey, we got to take care of these kids and we want to build a strong program. And only strong programs, strong programs are based on veterans and and kids with experience that stay with the program for four or five years. Let's let's build that culture here at this university. And then we're going to win championships because of that. And, 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 and then, you know, the, all that money pouring into the universities, it's still going to bug me a little bit, but I mean, I'm feeling better that at least some of these kids are being taken care of, you know, and that way (laughs) ethically I can support the sports a little more. I mean, yeah, you're right, Brent. I really could care less after the second round of the NCAA tournament, what happens because I really don't care about most of these schools. They, I mean, you know, most of them are the power five teams. And to be honest, I I really don't give a crap about Michigan or Ohio state and how much they take advantage of their athletes and, and the system. Um, Every once in a while, though, you get that James Madison that sneaks in there and you're following them through the final eight and into the final four, you know, and you're like, come on, man, come on, do it. You know, Um, adverse Goliath and you want him to win it all. You bet. (laughs) I, I think what's happened is through the 90s and into the 2000s. Um, before that, you had your same powerhouses. And I'm thinking about primarily college football. You, you had your Notre Dame, you had your Oklahoma, your Texas, your USC. You, you had the same group of powerful teams that ran uh, because of good coaching and, and you know tradition and stuff like that. And I think... Through the 90s and through the 2000s, universities started to realize that their cash cow was in their athletics and not in their student base. Meaning, let's say there's Carl and there's Brent, two students that go to university so-and-so. Carl is a stud 
quarterback leading the team, number one ranked team. Brent is a biochemist getting his degree at the same exact university. So-and-so university is going to make revenue off of Carl, the quarterback, not off of Brent, the biochemist, who may see some money after Brent graduates in the form of giving back to the school and stuff like that. However, that school gets recognition from Carl, the quarterback, through that entire year. I'm getting eyes and viewership on me. We're getting money going to the bowl game. We win the bowl game, and that money comes. You are the focal point of revenue coming into the school, and the student that is Brent is, you know what? We're taking his money as part of our revenue, and we're going to get him his education, and then he can carry on his own merry way where Carl is always going to be associated with so-and-so university. Oh, it's true. There, there is there. That, that's why I think the NIL uh, structure would benefit Carl in that case and Brent. Um, and, and, and on the side, no, it, it benefits Brent when the, the States jump in and say, all right, guys, enough is enough. We're no longer going to be charging Brent 190000 for his state education. Brent can come to our school for free and get his education because of all the money. The, the, the universities will not lose money, go in the red, or be bankrupt from that situation unless you are the state universities of like Idaho and Wyoming and North Dakota these smaller states who are not in these large conferences that have these billions of dollars absorbing in. And so it's, it still creates this uneven playing field for everybody. Well, I think, I think a major research university, let's say the university of Utah, for example, and you know how much I hate the university of Utah sports program, but university itself it's a good school because here's here's the reality. They bring in a lot of technology through their research uh, facilities and programs like their hospital. Uh, not only does it create a lot of jobs in the community, but you also have a lot of students filing through there. Like you're talking about Brent, the biomedical student, who is actually going to contribute overall to the university's bottom line because – um, the research he does, let's say, on a master's project or PhD project, the university still retains uh, the rights to his work while he's at the school. And, and so inadvertently, he does contribute to their bottom line because then the, that also gets, dis- dis- you know, gets um, sent out to the rest of the community that benefits from these, these sciences. Now, the question is, this is a real question, what... I mean, because these colleges and universities also have a lot of programs that are black holes that suck uh, in, you know, tuition and um, I don't have much of a monetary value, even though someone will argue, especially I expect someone in our audience right now who will say, well, you know what? History does have value. Um, Humanities does have value. Well, it does in an esoteric manner, uh, you know, way, but does it really in terms of economy economics and, and making these sure these universities are viable in the future. And so I think, I think your Brent example, um, yeah, if he's a, he was a gender study humanities student. Yeah. What is, what's he bringing, you know, other than his tuition uh, that he can bring. Then why do you have those courses? I don't know. That's a good question, except that there is some, I mean, there are value to the arts and maybe, maybe the, the question is why are these, why are, why aren't there certain universities just dedicated to those disciplines? And then you have, uh, you know, your bigger universities that generate the funds. And you were saying that there were a lot of these little smaller colleges. I think, I think the, I think one thing though, I think this is something to think about. If you're, if you're, let's say you're an administrator and your job is to, you know, well, let's say make the university uh, a better place. Well, define 
what success is in that in that regard i mean is it creating more buildings is it hiring more staff is it bringing more renown to the university is it creating more technological research options for the university i mean every school is going to have a different mission or different uh you know, just like most companies. And I think these smaller universities have a lot smaller budgets. The people that run them know that. And so they're run a lot more efficiently. And so you ask, well, how do these smaller universities exist? I think that's the main reason. I also think too, like, like my son, he went to a JC school. Why do we have these kids have to go to a four-year school? Why, why isn't it set up where you have your, your, um, your bachelor of science schools or bachelor of arts, your major schools. And that's where you go. You go like for two or three years only like to BYU or University of Utah, but your first two years, you go to a JC school that the state and the taxpayers fund. So you can get like a, a plumber certificate, or you can go and get your, uh, you, you can get a vocational degree or you can get your associates so that you can then go to the bigger school. I, I think, I think a lot of these freshmen and sophomores that get pumped through these big four-year schools, you know, I, I mean, a lot of that money is just money that they can scoop up. Uh, Cause that's they're, why. yeah, they're burning while well, they're trying to burn through a lot of those kids. And, and the reality is they could get these associate degrees and, college uh, uh, vocational degrees that they need to go out and be valuable contributors to society now that versus later, because some of these kids aren't going to be interested in a four year humanities degree or uh, are going to drop out of medical school before they get there because, you know, they simply find that they'd rather do something different. So, I mean, why do you need to, why do you need a bunch of business students at university of Utah and BYU? I mean, do you really? Um, you can go to University of Phoenix online and get a business degree, an MBA. You can go get better valuable experience working for a company than you can at some of these universities. So, you know, the whole system needs reform, not just it sports. Does. You know what I'm saying? It, the, the whole thing needs to be looked at again and, and built from the ground up. But, you know, I think there's too much money, though, too many, too many jobs that are protected, um, administrators protect each other's backside. Um, you know, you're not going to see big change. Um, unfortunately, um, it, the system is the way it is because it works for certain important people and the rest of us don't have enough time or we just don't pay attention. I mean, you know, I mean, do you really think about the dynamics of the finances and college sports when you're at Buffalo hot wings and you're watching the final four? I mean, no, not, not, not one bit. No. And, and I'm, and I'm not looking for, you know, like <clears throat> what kind of school is that, you know, school known or what kind of degrees and stuff is that school known for? What type of institution you're rooting on the team is what you're doing, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And you're, you're interested in the sport. It's it's entertainment. It's a release. And I think... Let me I ask you this. When's the last time, kind of a, a, a flip here, but when's the last time you watched an NBA basketball game? Uh, actually, I was a date. <laughs> 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 she... Uh, she had free tickets, so uh, she, we were supposed to go out and just grab something to eat, and then she's like, hey, you want to go to this this uh, basketball game with me? And I said, sure, and we went to – it was fun. It was the Pelicans and the Jazz this year, and uh, that was the first time I'd actually watch a Jazz game all year. And I was yeah, like – so, but that's wow. in person. What's the last yeah. time you watched one on TV? Oh, I haven't. <laughs> Not yeah, for a while. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. right. It, oh, now, last, let me ask. Last, the last time was a Boston Celtics Lakers YouTube re recording of a 1980s game in the championship series. How so, often in your teens and probably 20s did you watch an NBA game? Oh, all the time. All, all the, time. the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean, changed? Lakers, Celtics. What, what, why? What, what happened? Free agency, baby. That's what happened. I hate it. 
<laughs> uh, I mean, I understand it, and 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 maybe it's good for those athletes. But and, and now I sound like a hypocrite, but uh, with the college kids. But I think it's a little different college kids because the 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 uh, the 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 NBA players in the '80s were still treated fairly well income wise. I don't think they were getting a raw deal if they still had to stay on the same team for a long time. I, so it's a totally different situation than the college kids, but uh, I think it's free agency. I mean, you look at the NFL even, um, and the NFL has done a little bit better um, because they, they've they marketed the teams. Right, and not they always have. Players. The NBA yeah. decided to, to market players, and then right. you've created these personas that, I mean, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of most of the individuals in the NBA. They're, they're not really people I idolize. Uh, the things that work, work load. Load. Oh, <laughs> you know, LeBron, LeBron's a jerk. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Right, baby. We, we, we see a lot of that because now outside of, of Golden State, yeah. It, it seems like these teams that are winning these championships are like a group of guys that are like, hey, come on over here. And M- Milwaukee's another one. Milwaukee drafted all their players and they won the championship. And I mentioned Golden State. You know, we talk about how dominant they were. But outside of Kevin Durant, who came over for two years after they'd already won championships, Golden State drafted all those players. That's they, true. They put yeah. that team together through the draft. Not signing free agencies, not having a whole bunch of all stars come on over and join together, and how many championships we're going to win? One, two. You know, I, I, I think that moment right there when LeBron and and D Wade and uh, oh, yeah. Chris Bosh had that news conference, I think that turned a lot of people off, and they're <laughs> like, "No, this isn't what we." watched and what we grew up with and yeah. i i think through that the, the game evolved from where we saw fast break basketball and powerful big men inside what? and driving to the hoop to this drive it down court and pop the three drive it down court pop the three swing let's, it around pop the three let's play a little game here association game if i say larry bird what team do you associate with them okay. Magic Johnson, Lakers, Michael Jordan, Bulls, Isaiah Thomas, Pistons, Kevin Garnett. <laughs> you know, when when you first say, oddly enough, when you first say Kevin Garnett, I yeah. think Timberwolves. Yeah, that's where but he, he won his championship with the Celtics. You're like, I don't think of him as a Celtic. Okay. Uh, LeBron. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I cannot associate a team with him. I yeah. will give him credit for winning a championship in Cleveland. That's something right there. But yeah, look, you, you failed in Los Angeles. You yeah. went to finals with Miami, but you lost finals. And this, this comparison that's always been from day one, the comparison between Jordan and, and LeBron, we have to stop making that comparison. LeBron is a uh, one thing I will say about LeBron as a person. I don't think any of us can say he's not a good person. The All guy's right. building oh. schools for okay. underprivileged kids. You know, I mean, he's never done anything outside the NBA where there was any shame or anything like that. He's, uh, he's a think, pretty. I think he's a little racist towards white people. I also think I, he's. Outside of that fact, uh, yeah. I, I, I can't disagree with that. But, like, yeah. watching him in movies, he's entertaining. You know? He's he's, he's a Carl Malone body playing in the NBA. I, he wins that, a lot, though, in the game, too, though. I, I mean, I mean, he, he's always tr- – well, I mean, maybe it's other people trying to compare him to Michael and some of the other greats. But, I mean, I, I just don't think he's there. I, 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 I mean – Maybe he's- I think what turns us off is when he walked off the court in Cleveland and quit. Yeah. He, he, he basically quit. And Michael Jordan never quit. I mean, ever. Michael, I mean, so I, I've read a lot of stuff about Michael and his private life and what kind of oh, person. Oh, he's a jerk. 
He was an yeah. idiot. Sure, too. But I, keep in mind, too, that Chicago Bulls team was all drafted. Scotty Pippen drafted. Paxson drafted. Uh, Steve Kerr drafted. All of those, they weren't. It, the only one that came from the outside was Dennis Rodman. And people can say whatever you want to say about Dennis Rodman, but when he came to the Chicago Bulls, that's when they became the greatest team in history. All right. All right. Because you hold on, you 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 think about a guy who gets in people's heads and gets 20 plus rebounds. You give Michael Jordan a chance to make multiple shots off of a miss, we all know what happens. <laughs> all right. Let me ask you. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you some some fun questions here. All right. So if you had an opportunity to have lunch. This this is a lunch, like just like you know, go to wingers with with the guy. What is your all time of all the athletes that you know of? Which one would you would be your dream? Just go hang out and have some beer and, and a few wings with uh, for a half hour or an hour. Charles Barkley, hands down. Okay, all right, all right. Um, that would be the most entertaining thirty minutes to an hour of my whole entire life. Okay. Um, all right, let's see. Let's get another one here. How about a pickup game to 21? Who would you take on? Who would you challenge? Somebody, Somebody I want to be. <laughs> yeah, Danny but... Ainge. <laughs> <laughs> you take Danny, huh? Okay. Would you take the I'm the echo here, here, by the way? You take the L with it, though. Would that be okay? Can we say that? <laughs> No, I mean, I think in reality, um, I mean, probably Michael Jordan, you know? Just <laughs> see how good he is on the court. Yeah. Just to say, you know, just to like, even at 55 or, you know, however, well, he's not 55, but what is, he, you know, 58, 50, you know, whatever. I mean, kind of still phenomenal, you know? You know, you know which one I'd love to just play a little, uh, one game of tennis with. Andre Agassi, that dude's that dude is such a personality. I don't know yeah. if you remember or followed him at all. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What? Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. But but would you rather play against him or would you rather play against McEnroe, who would fill oh. the game with so many stories? You know, McEnroe would also make funny of you as they as you played. Yeah, that would. Oh, yeah. Be- that would be a great one. Actually, McEnroe would be I – I think he, you're right. I think that would replace uh, – or you could have a doubles game, yeah, Steffi Groff and uh, Andre and uh, and uh, McEnroe. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, else you got? Let's see. Um, which female sports star, if you weren't married, you'd be good with one date with? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm honestly not that into female sports. Maybe Anna Kornikova. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh well. Let's let's uh, let's go there. Okay. Is there one female pro basketball player that you think would beat you in a game of one on one at your prime? Uh, Cheryl Miller. Yeah, she was good. Real hey. deal. Boy, that was a name you dragged out of there. Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, Cheryl. For those, most people who are listening probably don't remember Cheryl Miller, but she played for UCLA, right? And- yeah, it all begins and ends. with. If there was no Cheryl Miller, I don't think you would see women's basketball to where it is right now. And same with Pat Summit. You was would it- not see those – women's college basketball to where it is today without a pad summit. And Reggie, Reggie Miller was her brother, right? Or is brother. Brother? kid brother. Yeah. yeah. That's what I thought yeah, I also UCLA shooter. Wow. Uh, no, yeah. I think Cheryl Miller went to USC. Yeah. She I don't think she went to US. Miller. Yeah. I don't think she went yeah. to UCLA. She didn't go to UCLA. You're right. There was another, yeah. there was another, uh, all everything uh a lady who played at ucla years before cheryl so yeah cheryl was amazing she was a legend so yeah um uh, okay all right well i mean but beyond for, that nobody else 
<laughs> for a female audience, I want you guys to know we do we 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 are aware of female sports. I mean, I guess the okay. So here's a controversial question, Brent, and might get us in trouble with some of the uh, listeners, but equal pay for not no 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 yeah. no, no yeah I'm agreeing. The, I'm the, sorry, the... it's 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 the difference of revenue. You right. look at the stands at a WNBA game, and I'm tired of ESPN trying to force feed this down me. There, there, you have maybe a thousand, two thousand people that attend. And you know what? If you enjoy watching it, that's fine. That that's great. But it is not the same entertainment level as even a Division three men's basketball game. I'm right. sorry, it it just is not the talent level. And and it's it's look. God bless them. They're they're doing what they want to do. They're doing what they enjoy doing. But a woman could not compete in the NBA. It just would not happen. It cannot. Happen. Now, yes, I'm I'm happy to see that there's some assistant coaches. It's not to say that women do not understand sports at all because that's not true at all. Right. I think there's a lot of women that that greatly understand sports, but it's the physical levels between a man and a woman which to bring in a whole other topic and we don't have to dive into this, but a man who thinks that he's a woman and then competes in women's sports, I don't understand how women are not up in arms against this. This is not the same level. Just because you think you're a woman, you still have all the muscle tones attributes of a man and it is not a level playing field, which we've seen as we've had these quote unquote women champion wrestlers who are men they're just dominating women quote unquote track athletes that are men that are just absolutely dominating it's it's not fair well it's and, not fair and, at all and you you 100 i'm on board with you in fact i want to devote a full hour to that topic i i was uh, uh helped out yeah. with the local high school as far as being kind of like the team dad slash kind of a unofficial assistant uh, to our high school's cross country and track team over a number of years when my son was running for him. And then, and then so you were the water boy. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I was the designated <laughs> driver to all the big long events where you drive down to Albuquerque. You were the bus driver. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but I, you know, you get close to the team and you start learning, you know, hearing their stories and these, these, these young ladies push themselves so hard and they're, athletic in their way yes. in terms of yes there is a definite physical difference between men and women though and I, I i think we make such a big deal that everything has to be equal there is nothing equal in our world nothing i am not equal to you in certain things in terms of our our talents in terms of sports even uh, even though I'd like to think I'm a lot better than you in basketball, there are there are some situations where you kind of dominated me. But uh, the reality is, we're, no one is identical, and this whole phenomena in our culture to try to force equality uh, is crazy. We should be celebrating the differences and also focus on what we each do well in our own given area of, you know, what, what we are. I mean, I'm a man, you know, and I'm proud to be a man. And even despite what, you know, people try to, to do to make me not feel that way. The reality is I think women should be proud to be women. And, and these young ladies work so hard for what they, they accomplish. And then to have some guy who says that they're a woman come in and take it away from them. Um, it's the biggest insult in the world. And I, I'll disagree slightly, maybe because I'm kind of attached to this a little more with the lady side of it uh, on the on the sports side. But women are OK with it, but they're getting shouted down on Twitter and other parts of our culture and 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 being called homophobic and and all kinds of terrible things because they're it's saying not homophobic. It's about yeah. being if, if you want to have equality. It, you, we're throwing in a whole new right. group and, and, and maybe the end, and again, we'll, look, we could talk about this on another episode, but maybe there becomes a third group of transgender athletes to compete against other transgender athletes and so on and so sure. forth. Yeah. Um, 
mean, I've always, I've been fine with that. We could have a third division and um, I'm afraid there's not a market for it yet, but I mean, maybe right, right. In my kids' generation there, they seem to be more open to this concept and maybe there will be a viable third option and if they should, they should go, you know, maybe they explore that, but yeah, I, I'm just not happy with the way things are right now. And, in women, I, I have one. Yeah. I have one last topic that I want to discuss b- before we wrap things up. And okay, you you kind of just touched on it a, a bit regarding youth athletics, and and we kind of talked about this, I think, in our first episode, the difference of youth sports with us growing up, as opposed to today, where, um, I you know there there's some leagues where they don't keep score you know there's there's this no winners and and no losers mentality but yeah yeah and and so this is this is the thing that i see happening and with that in in relationship to our society is as a kid growing up i was extremely competitive um i always if 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 I was taking second place, third place, fourth place, I was going to work harder. You know, I, I pushed myself harder. I, I, I didn't want to be second or third place. I wanted to be a championship. And, and you had that same exact mentality. I, th- I think we, you know, you're built on that to win, to be the top. And there's nothing wrong with winning. There, there, j- there, that is life. There's always going to be winners. There's always going to be losers. But when you take away the ability to keep score, to have a one winner, you lose, you, you take away the drive that is driven in people to succeed, which carries over out of sports and, and into life. And what's going to happen that I'm afraid of is we're going to have a whole society of mediocre people who give mediocre drive and, and effect into jobs and you're going to have a few people who take advantage of this and are able to fully succeed and there's already a large gap between the haves and the have-nots but there's going to be an even larger gap between the haves and the have-nots because this mentality of a drive to succeed is being stripped away from people as a child no, that's a good. There, you make some really good points, and you reminded me of a story that occurred when I was a kid. Um, this is before you actually. I grew before I moved to the neighborhood, but there's a, a church, you know, across that field where I used to live, that 5200 yeah. building. Um, yeah. Anyway, we were in a different area in Kearns area, and uh, we had a like a like a Cub Scout soccer night at that church, and. Uh, I remember the leader, she was a lady and she was the goalie and I, I scored like five goals and I thought I was like, I don't know. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I thought I was Pele and uh, I was telling everybody how good I was. I was, I was showing my Jersey off. I was getting in her face, getting mad at her when she, you know, cause she, I guess she was the goalie for me for a while too. And my dad was watching this the whole time. And uh, after the game was over and we got in the car, he uh, he had one of my more memorable lessons of life that I was taught. Uh, he was not happy with me, I'll put it that way. Um, and he he never was shy, let me know if he wasn't happy. And he, he thought I was despicable in my sportsmanship. And then he proceeded to explain what – proper sportsmanship was and being uh you know and showing uh, and showing proper sportsmanship and from that day i really did try on my end and i that his voice always would carry through whenever i was getting a little cocky and um and and i could see it in others too around me when they weren't displaying sportsmanship i think that lesson would be appropriate to these kids these days but I 100% agree with you, though, that when we take away these kids' ability to win, then they feel 
being good or being doing something really well, it does diminish it and take take something from it. And I mean, you can see that in the quality of of work, though. But there is still an, an innate competition gene built into most people, though. Even with these kids, even when I was coaching my daughter's basketball team and they wouldn't let us keep score, they all kept score. Everybody keeps score. And 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 so the question is, do you want the organization? Well, hold on, though. Hold yeah. on. Let me, let me. I don't think they all keep score. I think you've got that one parent that just is happy that their child is participating. Sure. And I think you'll find that that child in that sports league and probably later on in life isn't going to give 100% because why? Why yeah. should I give 100% and run all these ladders why should I spend hours of off time at the free throw line? Why should I do that when we're all going to get an award? I don't need to work super hard for that because I'm going to be rewarded at the end of the day for it anyway. So why should I? And that mentality is going to carry over to when he gets a job. And, well, why should I show up on time? And why do I need to, you know, uh, you know, push out, you know, X amount of, you know, doors on an assembly line, you know, I, I, we're all equal here. Why should we have to do that? Well, you really see that too. If you're in a, uh, industry where let's say you're not in sales and sales tends to bring out competition because it's like survival. But when you're not in a sales related position, you, you really see the bad habits that you're talking about manifest themselves <laughs> i i could but how are those people going to be salesmen when I, you have no drive no ambition to be better to push to drive to succeed well they don't work. they end up they end up yeah. quitting so you know and usually you just you know you know usually you just still with those who are actually competitive but i mean so now are, you're cycling through as a company with a bunch of mediocre people who give mediocre effect yeah that's well, all you're going to have I, you're probably right. There is something to that. I, I, I see it, uh, especially uh, in the non-sales related industries uh, where being late all the time and, and not a, you know, it's like this whole work from home remote thing. Well, I'm not, I'm going to quiet. I'm not going to go work for you if you don't let me work from home. I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, <laughs> so you'd rather not have an income for a period of time. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I live at home with my parents. You're 40 years old. You're 35 years old, and you still live at home with your parents? Well, it's expensive out there. Oh, well, I get <laughs> that, but, I mean, make something work. Why are you putting this all on your parents? Yeah, it, you're right. It, it is a problem. It is a problem, it, and I think it could, we could have a whole hour to talk about some of these problems that are occurring now that are getting worse in our society, but uh, we're taking yeah. away that. <laughs> that well, and, 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 and we're taking away that, that feeling of accomplishment, you know, yeah. when, when uh -huh. you begin a season and you have a goal and you push and you drive and you practice and you, you work things out and, and, you know, maybe, maybe you're mediocre that year, but you're still pushing for that. And, and you don't, achieve that and then you you come at you you see who won you see how they react you see what's going on and you're like god i you know that that's what i want you know like you and i looked at that kind of stuff as a kid we weren't happy losing but we learned from those losses because we wanted to to succeed like those people we were watching and so the next year we would come back and we would try harder and we would push harder and you, and you would strive and, and drive and, and push. And maybe you made it to the, the final, but you didn't still quite make it. You lost. You know, yeah. but you, you put that effort and you were disappointed of the effort you put. But it wasn't for not. It was for positiveness because now you come back even stronger and you push even harder and harder and harder until you finally achieve that that championship in your whole – it means so much. Your blood, blood, sweat, sweat, tears, hours, time into it to achieve a goal. Though, do you think, though, and, and, and some of this can be this whole generational X and millennial, and 
I, cause I remember back when I was a dad and younger dad, and I was, you know, you, you did this too. When you were younger, you coached your kids when they were in like little league era. I noticed a definite difference between little league sports and how they treat the score and who wins and gets trophies and that kind of thing. But once you get to junior high and high school, mostly high school, and, and I guess because of more recent exposure to the college and high school level, I mean, these kids are put under a lot of pressure that you don't get, not everybody gets a medal. Not everybody right. gets uh, all American status. Not everybody wins the event. Only one person wins the event. Um, and I mean, especially where my son was running in the high school level, this is like the big 12 uh, or big 10 of high school uh, running. And um, the same kids would always dominate and always win. And yes, it does push you though. And, and my son, it's pushed him uh, to be better, you know, to get better. And it's even to this day still pushing him on the college level. But some of these kids are just blessed with a lot of talent. And um, I mean, no matter how hard you work, you're never going to actually beat them. Uh, it's just genetic sometimes. And, right. um, you know, and not, I mean, I think in team sports, it equalizes <laughs> a little more. You got a more of an opportunity to find that place on the team or your specialty where it, it elevates you to a MVP type situation where you're, you know, but it, I don't know, man. I, I just think that, I think you're right when it comes to this is being an issue with our younger kids, but I, I don't, I think, I think they do get a full, I think they get hammered by, you know, um, you know, competition later in life. And, and so I don't know. I mean, you might be right though. We might lose some kids because most kids don't go to the high school sports and, you know, like, like I'm talking about like my kids, but uh, most well, of them are you brought up a point earlier yeah. and in in you had said when when we were growing up we didn't have aau there, there wasn't travel ball there weren't items like that there was just rec ball there was why why ba well, <laughs> That's what we played why ba you know there was more but, balance yeah there was more balance you, you yeah. would you'd be good in a, you try to be good in a lot of sports that's what, well, was cool. what you have now i think you still have the YBAs. You still have Little League Baseball. The, you, you have the, the city rec leagues. And, and that's where you're seeing the, the no scores and everybody's an equal. We're all winners here. But it's created this larger dynamic revenue stream of travel ball, of travel sports, of, of AAU and stuff like that. And – what if if you're coming if if you're a good athlete in rec ball, and you're maybe the best athlete that is on that rec ball team, that boy isn't going to be continuing to play rec ball. At least he should not continue to be. He's going to move over to the travel ball where you were talking about. We're seeing these kids that are gifted, that have yeah. that special talent, and they're being trained by people and getting coaching from former professionals and people that are ex expanding their game and at that level it is about winning and it and it, it is about you have to give that extra effort because you've got another kid on that bench that is hungry for your position and it's it's a small group but it's a very competitive group that i i think too though that creates more burnout as well um and i've true. noticed that, i've noticed a lot of that that these kids, some some kids are super talented, and like you say, they get on that AAU track, and their parents are hyper focused on them being successful and getting into a college, and then go pro. And some kids really thrive on that, and then other kids, it, it gets them to the point where they just quit. You know, well, and, what uh, happens is you get the parent who has the nine-year-old that's jacking home runs or launching three pointers. And they think this boy is the absolute next coming, you know, he, he's the next kid. He's nine years old. 
Okay. I've never we, we, we all think that our, our kids are at the top of, of the list at nine years yeah. old, but it isn't until you get that high school growth and body that you begin to see the difference that happens. <laughs> you know what's funny? I try to tell people, don't be that parent. Do not be that parent, please. You save your kids save your kids the uh the stress uh because you see those parents all the time and it drives you crazy it's like your kid isn't michael jordan your kid isn't steve young um i mean you know i mean if you really looked at the numbers who's going to make it to college division one who's going to make it to the pros i mean it's infinitesimally even less um, I was looking like, okay, I watched the NCAA division one. I, I know this isn't one you'd watch, but last night <laughs> Eric was home over the weekend. He's, he's home for the weekend because of his birthday. And uh, anyway, he, uh, he and I, we were watching the NCAA championship indoor. Uh, and so, you know, and <laughs> we were, yeah, I watched we, that. Yeah, yeah. We were watching. No, I didn't watch that. Kidding. The three thousand. <laughs> well, we were watching the the five thousand meter uh, indoor race, and some of these guys are hitting thirteen fifty or thirteen forty. Yeah, that's super fast. And I mean, most of the D one kids right now can't get lower than I mean fourteen forty five to fourteen fifty is a good time. I mean, it, it's a time that usually their coaches are like, wow a full minute faster uh, to be elite. And I mean, the, the, it's just amazing. And, 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 and in, in the track world, if you go pro, you make maybe 75,000 to a hundred thousand a year max. And mm-hmm. those, those athletes have to work just as hard as any football athletes do to make the NFL and the kids are phenomenal. Uh, their their big thing is the Olympics. If they can get yeah. into the Olympics, that's that's the end all of all. You I know, mean, that's just huge. But very few will ever ever even have a chance to do that. I mean, the odds of you being on an Olympic team and running the mile are so low. I mean, you have a better chance of winning the freaking million, $10 million lottery with that Ed McMahon dude. I mean, it's that hard. And, and so, I mean, these call these parents, when the, these kids are like, I mean, yeah, keep score, but also keep it, keep, keep balance, keep, keep your head on. Um, let you, let, you know, if you're going to, okay. If Johnny doesn't hit three home runs that day, don't 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 knock him and and get after him and say what's your problem today you say okay how'd you feel about the game johnny well I, it wasn't one of my better games dad i struck out three times what do you think you can do better the next time that's what you ask him you don't you don't you, and you know what i'm saying you don't overemphasize you know something that's really unrealistic um i mean winning's fine and 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 trying to do your best and get your personal best each time but um and that's not about beginning a participation trophy oh that's nice you're even trying out for track no i want you to always do your best each time you're out there on on the field i want 100 percent effort each time uh, and, and i think that's okay as a parent telling your kids that but where I think you have to cro- draw that line is when it gets to the point where you're starting to live your child's, your fantasy through your child. You didn't make the NBA, Carl. I mean, you didn't play college basketball at BYU. You can't dictate that to your, you can't live that vicariously through your child. Okay. So what, what, none of my kids wanted to play football or basketball. What did they play? They run. They don't play yeah, anything. Yeah. Run. Okay. Well, I could either be happy about that and support that and, and learn how to, to, to support that as a parent, or I can be grumpy and upset that they didn't do what I think they should have done. Don't be that parent is all I'm saying. You know, that's you know what's crazy about parent. baseball. Yeah. What's that? You know, what's crazy about baseball is if a player hits over 300, 
he's considered a hitter. You know, somebody that's batting 320, 335, that's a phenomenal season. I want you to think about that. 300 means he is successful 30% of the time, yeah. meaning 70% of the time he is not successful. And that's a great baseball player. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's, it's incredible to think about. That look at Michael Jordan. Eight percent of the time, a baseball player is not going to be a professional baseball player is not going to be successful. Well, look at Michael Jordan. How many winning shots did he actually make versus how many he missed? Right. We don't remember the ones he misses. We yeah. remember the fadeaway to the left against Cleveland, jumping up in the air. That's Making, what we remember. And like making Russell look like an idiot as he. Beats the Jazz in game six. as he yeah. pushed him to the limit. Well, he he he, <laughs> sh- he he faked him out of his shoes, dude. Let's be honest about that. He so. pushed him. He pushed <laughs> well, pushed and and faked him out of the shoes. I mean, that was anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. You, you're going to be unsuccessful more than you're going to be successful in anything in life, and as a parent. Uh, your job as a parent is just to let them know, Hey, I'm proud of you being out there, but I'm also, you know, like everything in life, I just expect you to go 100% effort in anything you do in life to be, you know, and then the other thing is, um, what, you know, tell, you know, think about it. Cause if they start thinking this way, when they're an adult, when you're long gone, they're going to be a success later in life because they're going to look at, you know, when they, when they do mess up or when they, when, when things aren't going right, they're going to start asking that question. Okay. What do I do to be better? What do I need to do differently the next time? So that result doesn't occur. And then, then things will change for them and things will get better. So, you know, I, I just, you know, I, that's the one thing I caught caught a couple of times going into that helicopter mode and, and everybody does. Every uh, parent does. It, it's, it's part of it. I mean, it's 90 degrees outside. He's sweaty. He's dying. He didn't have a great race. This is his junior year. I remember this and, or his senior year. And I was like, dang, Eric, you missed this, this, and this. And he's like, dad why aren't you just kind of happy that i'm out here in the top 20 finished in the top finished. finish <laughs> yeah and I'm that's, like, that's me at the gym you know like i'm just happy i made it you know walking out of here and not on a stretcher you know <laughs> think about it. here's my fat ass sitting on a lawn chair getting up yelling at him to run faster that my son <laughs> isn't running a two mile in less than 11 minutes and i'm thinking Boy, you are one hypocritical son of a gun, aren't you? <laughs> so after that, that I'm cruising too. Good grief, that's cruising, man. Yeah, almost having a heat stroke, and I'm sitting there, I'm a, you know, sitting on my lawn chair, <laughs> drinking my cold one, watching him and getting mad. <laughs> what a jerk. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, that taught me a lesson. And your kids can teach you so much. So anyway. Well, uh, I think we, uh, I think we wrap this one up, bud. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. So it was a fun, fun, fun morning. Um, yeah. all right. Well, we'll, we'll see you guys all later and, uh, you have a great week, man. And I'll, I'll hey. catch, catch you. And next. everyone, thanks for tuning in. Recommend us to your friends. Join our, our Facebook page, three dad bods. Um, you know, we, we love to hear your input. And again, yeah. you know, thank you again for listening. We greatly appreciate it. Been a good one, Carl. All right. You have a one too, man. Talk to you later. We'll have talk a great to you later. All, All right. right, everybody.